Good afternoon, Mark Peacock. Welcome to 30 Minutes with LinkSpring. Delighted to be here. Very excited to uh, have this topic today, which we're going to cover an introduction to data modeling, haystack tagging, and how end users and building owners can benefit from haystack. And I think we'll all agree that there's no question today that data is impacting the building automation, energy management, and smart buildings market. The data produced by the equipment, the systems, the devices that we now have out there in our buildings now has become more valuable than the devices themselves. However, if, when we look at that data and all and its availability that we have at our fingertips, it turns out that there's one thing to have access to the data, it's another to make it useful and actionable. And the primary barrier to using the data from diverse devices and systems is truly knowing what it means. So this is where the whole concept of tagging comes in and what we're going to talk about today. And I'm delighted to have on board with me today John Petsy, who's a principal in Sky Foundry. And both John and I are coming to you not as our respective companies, Sky Foundry and LinkSpring, but as board of directors of Project Haystack. A couple of housekeeping things. Yes, we are recording this and making it available to one and all afterwards. So we'll send out links and things like that. Tanya will get that out. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John. And he's going to cover truly what Haystack is, what it's all about. And then upon his completion, I'm going to touch on some of the benefits and the value for building owners and operators. So, John? All right. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to everyone about not only Project Haystack, but the interesting challenges of using data. So let's just start off by talking about what Project Haystack is. Uh, the first thing it is, is actually a number of things. The first thing it is, it's a community of people who've come together to address one of the key challenges in using the data coming out of the devices and systems that we have in our buildings. And that challenge is that the data actually has poor semantic meaning, which is a fancy way for saying, unless you know about the building, you don't necessarily know what any of the data means. They have cryptic brief names, combinations of jumbled abbreviations, et cetera. And if you're not familiar with the building, you don't know what it means. So if you want to use that data in reporting, analysis, or other applications, you end up facing a manual challenge. You have to manually map the data. It's also called data wrangling, et cetera. And the issue, the reason why that's important is it adds cost before we can actually use the data for benefit. And so the vision of Project Haystack is let's solve this problem. Let's come up with a standardized approach called the methodology so that we can all describe our data in a standardized way. And that'll make it easier and more cost effective when we want to use the data for analysis, visualization, reporting, et cetera. And you know, there's a good analogy here. Really, you can think of Project Haystack as really a markup language for data, okay? A way to mark up the data in a uniform, consistent way so we'll all know what it means. So here's a typical example, all right? A use case, you know, somebody says, uh, "Hey, take a look at this and uh, analyze this." And now, remember, I have no background or understanding of the building. I'm handed this piece of data. It has a strange name, ZN3-WWFL4. Hmm, wonder what it is. And it has the last value of 76.2. Now, before I can analyze that, before I can comment on it, before I can say it's okay, I need to know what it is. Now, the first thing I'd want to know is units. Is it degrees C or degrees F, right? That's pretty obvious. But what if it isn't temperature? What if it's kW, kilopascals, RPM, et cetera? So I need to know what it is. And you know, we've done that historically with units, right? It might say degrees Fahrenheit. And that helps us. So we'd say, you know, is 76.2 degrees Fahrenheit an OK value? Is my system working right? But you know what? I couldn't answer that question if I don't know more about what it is. Is it a zone temperature? Because if it is, you know, that, that's fairly warm. Might be a little uncomfortable in that zone. 
But wait, if it's a return air temperature, 76.2 degrees Fahrenheit might be exactly where I want to see it. Now, if it's a chill water temperature on a hot summer day like we're having here today, that wouldn't be a good value, right? So in our example, let's just say it's a zone temperature. Well, it turns out I need to know a little bit more before I could really comment on whether that value is okay because, you know, what's the schedule? 76.2 on night setback might be fine. I might also want to know about whether it's an exterior zone, is it a VAV type system, what air handler serves it, because maybe if it's warm there, the problem is with the air handler, right? So these are all the questions I'd have to ask before I could comment. But the question, what we want to address is how do we convey the answers in a standardized way that's both human readable and machine readable? So let's look at a simple example, a simple haystack example of this methodology to Describe the meaning of data with what we call semantic tagging. People also call it metadata or data model. Okay. So down below, if we look there in the red, is a name. Maybe I have HU1-SAT. Right? That's the name the BAS has. But the tags in green describe what it is. These are our descriptive tags. It says it's a sensor value. It's discharge, air, temp, and its units are degrees F. And then in blue, we have another type of tag, a tag that talks about ownership or relationship or association. It says, hey, by the way, this is tied to a piece of equipment known as HU-1. That's a real example of haystack tags at work. And notice that they're readable. So we'll look a little further at a more detailed example of what it might look like in a software application. Here's a software application showing the tags for that original example of ZN3-WWFL4. It captures all of these descriptive, all this descriptive information. They're really facts about the data. And with these facts, now a human being could look at it, but more importantly, software applications can look at this and determine automatically what the data means. I want to bring us back to that example of a markup language. You know, we all work with a markup language every day. You know, think of this example. I can point my browser at your website, and I can read what you've written there. And you and I didn't have to uh, pre-decide anything. We didn't have to coordinate, hey, I want to come to your website. Uh, you know, what are the rules for your website so I'll be able to read it? And the reason for that is that the world agreed on a markup language. Your website shows text, but there's a markup language called HTML, hypertext markup language that you use when you build a website to mark up the text, to say this is a header, this is a footer, this is in bold, this is large, right? This is italics, right? So if you use HTML on your website, I'll be able to read the data, but in this case, most of the data is text, right? Well, Haystack does the exact same thing for device data, a markup language for device data. So now let's talk about what it enables. Why do, we, why do we really care about this, right? Well, we talked about the challenge of working with data from different systems, if you're not intimately familiar with it, right? But there are other things. It takes us to a truly automated future. For example, BAS graphics, you know how much work is typically involved in putting them together? What if they could auto-generate? What does that designer do when he sits down to draw a graphic? He says, well, I want an air handler, and which points are associated with it, and which one's the supply air temperature sensor point, so I can put it in the right place on the graphic, and which one's the discharge, et cetera. Well, think about it. If all of that data is, all of that information, that descriptive information, is contained with the data, the software can now automatically draw graphics that are correct, that are appropriate, that put the data in the right places that can even determine it's a multi-zone unit, a single zone unit, it has reheat, it doesn't, etc. Think about how much time can be saved there. And there are applications on the market today already exploiting this capability to dramatically reduce the amount of effort, time, and cost in implementing graphics. But it goes beyond graphics. Even control logic can automatically find all its targets or devices. You could have a VAV control sequence, and it just goes out and finds all of the things that are tagged as VAV boxes, and it applies the control logic to them. Again, dramatically reducing the engineering effort to implement automation and control systems. 
And when you want to integrate with other third-party applications, the fact that they can quickly look at the data, understand the meaning of the data, means that you can implement software applications from maintenance management, CMS, visualization reporting, much more quickly with less effort, lower cost. And it's even leading to a new tool, a new generation of engineering tools that streamline these tasks for the application of software against buildings, building system data. So that's essentially what Haystack is, but it actually, as I said, is more than one thing. So the next thing that the community has done is they've first defined this methodology, but the second thing they've done is say, using this methodology, let's go and define examples, models, standard equipment models. So things like chillers and air handlers and boilers and VAV boxes, et cetera, and electric meters and on and on and on have been modeled by the community. In other words, everybody comes together and says, hey, we agree these are the tags you put on these types of things. And there's an ongoing effort where uh, birds of a feather get together and say, hey, I want to let's form a working group to determine the tags for solar arrays or for compressors or for other types of equipment. But the next thing that the community does is develop third-party software tools to make it yet easier to build applications that utilize Haystack, that integrate with it, et cetera. Some of those include a REST API and a Java reference implementation and reference implementations in JS, no, uh, Node.js, Dart, Python, C++, all freely available, all open source, all can be downloaded so people can build applications that work with Haystack data and they can do it quickly and easily. There's even one for, of course, the popular Niagara system. There's a jar file that you can load into both Niagara AX and Niagara 4 that allow it to speak Haystack. So you can capture all of the information, the tagging, et cetera, in the Niagara system when you engineer it. And then when another system wants to get the data, it comes out with all of that descriptive information, thereby dramatically reducing the software effort. And other people have built engineering tools to take in data because, you know, it's not just data coming across in BACnet aerobics. You might be bringing in data from a SQL database. You might be bringing in data from CSV files or text files. So one of the other members of the community created an open source tool called Project Builder Plus that allows you to basically bring in data and use a variety of tools to map it, tag it in a very efficient way. So we want to talk a little bit more about why Haystack matters. And one of the main reasons is that we're getting data from so many different devices and systems, right? Typical buildings don't have products just from one manufacturer. They have products from many manufacturers. And those manufacturers, even if they use a standard protocol, they don't use a standard naming convention, and most of them don't go to this next step and provide a way to put this descriptive information in. And it's an important thing to describe or to mention that one of the things Haystack is not is a standardized naming convention. Haystack isn't telling you how you must name your points. You name them any way you want, whether you're following the owner's standard or your own. What Haystack does is give you the ability to mark up that data, those names, those descriptions, with uniform interpretable tags that describe exactly what it is. And there's often confusion about that. People often think that uh, Haystack is trying to tell you how to name your points, but it really isn't. But with this rapidly growing amount of data being produced by all these systems, this really matters because you know what? As Mark said, having data is one thing. Being able to utilize it, making it actionable, being able to get the value out of it is another thing. And the first step is understanding the meaning of the data. So the way Haystack solves this challenge, just to kind of recap, is it makes the data self-describing. Right? The tags come over with the name, with the value, all the tags come over, and now we know what the data means and allows this automatic, automatic interpretation to dramatically reduce engineering effort. And a neat thing about it is even though this is used at the software level, it makes it machine readable too. So a technician can look at the tags. In fact, that's one of the other cool things about Haystack. You can use Haystack methodology with a yellow sheet of paper and a pencil to capture the descriptive information manually. You could use it in Excel where the tags are columns in a worksheet. You can use it in a database 
where it's part of the schema of the database. And you can use it in protocols like the REST API protocol that's been developed by the community. But you can also include it in other protocols. Uh, the uh, ASHRAE BACnet group just recently uh, was at the Haystack Connect conference and spoke about how it'll be possible to carry Haystack tags in the next generation of BACnet, BACnet Extended Web Services. All right, so let's talk about how it can be applied because people say, well, wait a minute, what if, what if my system doesn't have this built in? I have an existing system. Well, the neat thing about Haystack is you can use it, as I said, from a yellow sheet of paper to a protocol. So let's look at three examples here. On the left, we have the ideal situation where the end devices actually implement Haystack. That could be a Nair AX controller, a Niagara 4 controller, and it could be numerous other products that are now implementing Haystack at the field device level. And what that means is a tool can suck up that data with all the descriptive information, and then a server can do value-added applications, reporting, visualization, analytics, conveying that information to mobile devices, etc. That's the ideal. But of course, most of the world isn't that way yet. So one of the things we see is often that the end devices don't have any knowledge of Haystack, but at the next level, the global controller level, the supervisor controller level, you have the ability with some systems, like Niagara and some others, to actually add the tags there. So as part of the engineering process, you add the tags there. Maybe not as ideal as having them in the end device, but once they're added there, now in the same way, they're available directly to those higher level applications. And then finally, the last example, nothing in the system is capable of having Haystack tags added to it. Then what do you do? Well, you suck the data out into a tool. And in that tool, you put the tags on it, create, a, if you will, a new database that has all the descriptive data, and then it goes into the applications just as we've described. So Haystack can be used even with existing systems that had no awareness of it in the past. One of the other things people ask about is where does this new standard stand with adoption and support? We've had a great history. It was the effort was originally formed in 2011 with just a small group of people. Today, the project-haystack.org website, where you can go to learn more about this, has over 1,500 registered users. It won the 2013 Digi Award at the IBCon event for the best intelligent building technology innovation. Uh, the community put together three now uh, major of conferences, the first one in May 2013. Over 20 companies joined a press release uh, showing their support back in 2013. There's a guide spec. It's now an official 501C corporation. And we had our Haystack Connect conference in May, and we just had another one uh, last month in May 2017 at Saddlebrook. And continue on with adoption and support on the next slide. Haystack is used. It's extensively deployed. There are literally thousands of buildings and tens of thousands of devices using Haystack today. Oftentimes you don't hear about it because it's kind of internal any more than you'd hear about, you know, some other uh, descriptor on a specific point in a BAS. Right? And it's being adopted by equipment manufacturers in their next generation hardware products. There's dozens of systems integrators who are trained on it and using it every day. It's now over 1,500 people registered. Um, Kava did a white paper um, in March of 2016, which really recognized the importance of it. And Intel just joined the board of directors in March of 2017 and has thrown a lot of support behind it. They were keynote speakers and our largest community level sponsor at the most recent Haystack Connect event last month. Now more on adoption and support. These are our, a little bit of information on organizations that are officially involved. On the left we have the founders and board members. Eight different companies make up the board of directors. And then associate members over on the right. Associate members who are joining the effort and helping to support the work of the community. Now, there's lots of resources. If you go to the Project Haystack website, which we'll show you in a minute, there are, there are technical resources, all of the tagging libraries. There's uh, guide specs. There's uh, the Haystack Connections magazine, multiple issues of that. There's um, white papers. 
and then, you know, as I said, many software tools, reference implementations, et cetera. So the community has really put together an extensive amount of reference information to help you learn about Haystack, implement it in your products and your systems. So some of the key takeaways. Here's an open source standard started in 2011, so we're up on our sixth year. It's deployed, it's working, it's proven. Completely zero cost. You can download everything the Haystack community has done, even without registering on the site. But we'd encourage you to register and contribute to the discussions on the forum. It's, it's, it's extensible. You can use it beyond just the models that the community has agreed upon. You can, you can add your own tags and descriptors. And it can be implemented in even the smallest devices. And it's both machine readable and people readable. So final thought I'd like to leave you with, now that you have some understanding of Project Haystack, is considering join, consider joining the effort. Go to project-haystack.org, the website. Learn how to utilize it. Contribute your knowledge. Join in the forum or working groups as people come together to address specific new um, equipment models that haven't been uh, done by the community yet. Help us advance the effort because it's going to help us all deliver better systems at lower costs to building owners and operators. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, John. And, you know, now that we've covered you know, a good basic understanding of Haystack, you know, what it is and that type of thing. We thought it would be useful to kind of look at this now from an end user's perspective. What value, what benefits will this help deliver to end user customers, and especially for the system integrators we have on the phone, delivering solutions for them and creating additional value, and then for the end users on the phone, you know, what value will this bring for you? So I'm going to cover several of these. And first and foremost is, again, it's ensuring that the data is consistent and meaningful and can be adopted and accessible across the many, many different applications that uh, we all use today. And to reiterate again, you'll you, you, you heard John say it, I said it earlier, is that, again, it's to make sure this data is going to be actionable. So if we move on to the next slide, and again, I'm going to go over these in, in short term because I want to be cognizant of the time, is, you know, it enables for an end user to have all their data categorized. So ensures that the data contained within the systems and the devices are truly being understood and there's some type of standard, if you will, that is being applied. It's also for them to know what data set is and whether it's potentially going to be a value or not. Again, we've heard all along about big data and all this data, but again, I think we'll all have come to the conclusion it's not about big data, it's about data that's smart and relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. And what I believe this last bullet point is probably the most important takeaway from this particular slide is that Haystack is enabling to bridge this gap of data interoperability, especially from all these different systems. Moving on with Haystack, it helps enable data portability. So again, being able to establish the same type of naming conventions and modeling, no matter if it's air handler A from certain manufacturer or air handler B from a, another one, and then being able to port that data from place to place. Further, it's giving data some type of uniformity. And again, I think that is one of the biggest challenges out there that we continually hear is, great, I can access my data, but I have no uniformity to it. I have no idea what, what it means, no idea how to use it, and it further allows me to take that data and visualize it, normalize it into some type of understanding 
that you can use across multiple users and things like that. Next value point is it's all about selection and choice. Being able to normalize that data and define it in terms of what it is and what attributes it possesses. So you can flag certain data with special value and select certain types of data and to classify and identify those as commercially uh, valuable and, of course, useful. Again, being able to maximize the use of that data. Another value point is it allows for consistency and then helping ensure the integrity of that data. And being able to in, ensure that integrity of data is extremely important, particularly as all these different devices, systems, and things like that all operate differently. And again, you want to ensure that the data is accurate and is on point and that you can establish relationships between them. This next one is where Haystack really helps a lot is in the developing a data management strategy. I think we all, up until recently, started going into, oh yeah, let's utilize data, it makes sense and all that. But without a good data management strategy, I think it causes us a lot of pain and agony. So again, looking at the value that Haystack brings with tagging, semantic modeling, being able to create a foundation of the data and to unlock those opportunities gives a true benchmark here and a good solid foundation for you to develop a good data management strategy, both as an integrator to suggest it to your clients and your customers and to an end user for them to be able to have an internal data management strategy to manage this. We're also seeing some places recently where Haystack has helped in the governance side of it. Again, there's no use for the data unless people know what it is and you have access and that right data is being used for the analytics and things like that. So it's a good provider and enabler to help ensure data governance throughout this. Next point as far as value goes from the end user's perspective is it helps enable vendor lock-in. And again, I think as open has become the norm today and one of the key benefits as far as not being locked down to one particular vendor or application, this is again where Haystack is able to deliver good value and benefits. Again, it can be shared amongst any type of vendor, any device, and any system. And sort of related to data integrity is this whole idea of data transparency. Being able to really see and look at and analyze data that is real. And there's so many cases that I've seen recently where the data has to be in real time. And again, this is where Haystack can help speed up that opportunity to deliver data in real time. And Again, what we're seeing from many folks that have adopted the, the Haystack methodology is that they've established best practices with data. And Haystack has enabled them to be able to do that and in fact, in many cases, enforce the best practice or a best practice procedure. The tagging requires that built-in information built on what is it, what is the information that forces that implementation for a standardized process to be able to maximize the value of the data. To reiterate what John had said earlier, there is lots and lots of acceptance of Haystack out there in real world examples, both North America and globally. And so as, again, people are utilizing this as part of their data management strategy, and I will just keep going on time. John talked about the community. It is community-based, and uh, which is a good thing. And it, there's truly this vibrant, very active community from all walks of life who are contributing to what it is and uh, the value that Haystack is bringing. And 
kind of to end with is that you know we we talk about data and the value of data and this is from the economist magazine that recently about 2 weeks ago they came out saying that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil but it's data and that's kind of eye opening to me personally and really reinforces a couple things that we've all talked about and learned over the years. So with that, we're open to a couple questions. I've got a couple questions here is from a person out there. And I think we're just going to reiterate this, John. I think this one is for you. What is the easiest way to get involved in Haystack? So there's multiple different ways, depending on how far you want to get involved. If you go to project-haystack.org, you can read everything the community has done without even signing up. We'd encourage you to sign up and uh, check the box uh, so that you get a daily digest, so you see the types of conversations that are happening. If you're new to it, you're going to see conversations that you have no idea what people are talking about, and you're going to see other conversations from other people at your level who are just beginning. So I'd really recommend that. I'd read the white papers to give a background. I'd read uh, the magazine to show uh, the magazine issues to show how people are using it and the different companies using it. Uh, and I think then, you know, if you spend a little bit of time, you'd be comfortable uh, looking at some of the working groups. Maybe you're an expert in refrigeration systems or solar or one of the other working groups that have been set up to uh, focus on uh, developing tags and have the community debate, you know, what types of tags and descriptive elements are needed for different types of equipment. We've got time for one more question, and the question is, uh, this is from a system integrator. I've just started to work with a new customer of which they have Haystack methodology in their existing buildings. So as a new person in there, if I know about Haystack, can I go in and immediately take advantage of Haystack? And to me, John, if you want to elaborate after, I, I, I'm going to give you the, the, first, the one word answer is yes. Again, once you know about Haystack, you can immediately walk in there and take advantage of what they already have. Yeah, you know, if, if the software is implemented in the product or application uh, to, to, be, to allow you to add tags, this is no rocket science to say, you know, what is this? This is a sensor discharge air temp degrees Fahrenheit, right? And now that information is perfect. You know, permanently captured. Um, you know, software developers have to learn a little bit about the API and the structure and those things if they're going to build it into a product. But once it's built in, it's the same types of things you would do if you were configuring a point in a BAS anywhere. Anyways, you're just going to add a few more pieces of information that define the meaning of the data going forward. Good. Well, again, I, uh, we're we're at a time limit. Again, I want to thank John for participating in the webinar today and we hope that you've learned a little bit more about Haystack and what it is and the value it delivers to end users and we again we will have this recorded and the slides made available here in the next couple of days we thank you for your participation and we look forward to having everybody again uh, next month so thank you and have a great day